Anyways, so we were supposed to finish the religious abuse last week. It did not happen, guys. <laughs> I tried. Really, I did. We went 30 minutes, and I had to I had to leave for Texas, and I was just like, this is just, it's just not happening. So here we are, and uh, this will be the time. It's going to be this week. I, I can feel it in my bones. Last week, we, uh, we were talking about um, counselors and whatnot, and, and whether I... I felt like you know they were a good thing or whatnot and i remembered excuse me i remember that i neglected to talk about the differences between these things so first off uh, we used a lot of terms i think we use therapist the most and i just wanted to kind of clarify what those terms are a counselor is someone who hopefully um, is trained to give guidance a counselor they counsel okay psychologist is someone who studies the mind how the brain works and they can they sometimes also attempt to treat the brain with either through drugs or other, through other treatments there's different methods of treating the brain um, but primarily that's a person who studies the brain um, and then there's a therapist now a therapist is a person trained to help treat somebody's health problems which can be either mental or physical um, so that takes us to the last thing I wanted to say about what, when we brought up the therapist last week. First off, there are some therapists who are just very poorly trained. And they don't know what they're doing. And um, then there's some who are not trained at all, but still call themselves a therapist or a counselor. They have no education in the, in the area. They have no idea what they're talking about, but then they still call themselves which leads us to a series of questions that I think are absolutely essential for whether or not you found the right therapist or not. Now, I do not disagree that therapy is a good thing. I just remember which is which. A psychologist is going to be the one who typically gives you pills for your brain. A therapist is going to generally going to be more of all-inclusive. It can be either or. And a counselor is usually somebody who just kind of talks with you about things. So typically, now, those terms are sometimes not used as black and white as I just made them, but those, so okay. Um, first question, are they licensed? This is a very important question to ask when you're going to somebody for counseling or therapy. To get licensed, you have to pass certain requirements for the state. You have to be educated for a certain amount. You have to study under for a while. There, there's a whole process that's involved. And so if they aren't licensed, that's kind of a red flag. And also remember that some people present licenses that aren't legitimate license so there are fakes out there too you're probably not going to run into them in a professional business they're going to be more of like oh i have my own practice or my own home practice double check that they actually are licensed uh then the second question do they do the talking the better the counselor the less talking they actually do really that is the kind of this go-to standard yeah. it's go ahead it's funny because i wanted to i was thinking about um majoring in counseling, mm -hmm. but I'm always afraid, like, you know, what, what would I say to the, to the, you know, to the patient or whatever? Professional counseling is not about having all the answers, because they actually tell you, you better not give them the answer, because then, if it doesn't work, they can see you. <laughs> so, they actually tell you that in counseling classes, which you'll probably eventually take one of those classes, so you'll figure it out for yourself. Um, but, uh, the, yeah, so the, the better the counselor, the, the, the less talking they'll do. The worst counselors will sit there and they'll talk the whole time. And they'll even sometimes put their problems off on you. And it's like, who's counseling who? Um, the, the slightly better ones will listen for a couple minutes and they'll give you all the solutions. And all The ones who are slightly better than that will listen and then give you a solution. And then the ones who are the best will do the most amount of listening and then help you to discover how to problem solve on your own. They won't just give you the answer. They'll 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 try. They'll ask probing questions that help you to do. Like oh, I just don't know what to do. What should I do? It's like I'm not a life coach. I'm a counselor. How do you feel about this? What do you think you should do? Um, have you thought about this? See, there's a huge difference there. Now in pastoral ministry, it's a little bit different because you, they, pastors tend not to have the education necessary. They have the religious experience, but the mind is so much more complicated than just fitting it in a box like that, and they're typically only uh, trained in theology. I, I'm a big believer that the church, that pastors should not um, be giving 
counseling. I, I think somebody should be trained for that. I think pastors should be trained to pastor, and they should do that. And I think that counseling really should be done by a trained medical professional, somebody who's not overly quick to just hand out pills, but also somebody who's going to take this problem serious. And I feel like there's people who just go to one or the other extreme. So anyways, do are they licensed? Do, do they do all the talking? And then the last thing, do they advise or do they help you discover when, when somebody just sits there telling you what to do, it's like that's not really not really the idea. In fact, I was talking to somebody who is a licensed counselor, uh, and they were a therapist, no a counselor, and they were saying about how eighty percent of the of the process in those sessions is the person just getting to tell their story. That means they're just talking for eighty percent of it without even changing a single thing, and that that's eighty percent of their recovery. So, I mean, I think that that's kind of important to note. And so I wanted to clarify that because I feel like we kind of brushed over it last week. Definitely not against uh, therapists. I just am for them doing it right. So uh, we were talking about the religious abuse, and maybe it leaves you with the idea that maybe there's only fake people left in church. Maybe church is just filled with nothing but fakes. There's no more genuine anymore. And here's the thing. And I'm going to add a little bit to this, but the basic idea is people don't stop believing in God. They get hurt by people and push them away. I have never met an atheist who does not have a history of being hurt by the church. Richard Dawkins grew up, I believe, as a Methodist or Episcopalian or Lutheran. When I, I always forget. It's one of those that, that's a lot bigger in England than, than here where we live. Um, and uh, he grew up in that, was not a good environment, and he became what he is. Uh, Hutchins, a very cynical guy, I actually know nothing about his his uh, background, so I can't tell you if he grew up in the church or whatnot, but I would strongly guess because why else would you turn so cynical where your whole purpose in life is just to make fun of people's faith? Like, when do you get that jaded? But I would add also to this that sometimes it's not just getting hurt by people. It's going through a very traumatic situation and being left with the idea of where are you, God? Yeah. And... That's not necessarily some somebody's fault. That's more of just the harsh reality of, of life crushing on you. And um, not everybody's willing to keep on the journey and say, let's see what God has to teach me from this. A lot of people just say, yep, I'm done. So there's that. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, and I mean this next point with all of my heart, Jesus said in the Bible that the church would endure. That gives me hope, and that tells me this, that no matter what happens and how dark it gets, there will always be true Christians somewhere. I've been in some churches where everyone there was just mean, nasty, hateful person. It was a club. It wasn't really even a church. I've been in some where just a lot of people were, in which case they were the good people were strongly outnumbered. I've been in some where the mean, nasty people were the, were the few. And then I've been in some churches where they loved people, they loved each other. There is some of everything out there. And the problem is, is that sometimes we give up hope looking for a good church, and sometimes we don't want to be a good church. We want other people to constantly feed us, but we don't want to have to grow um, sometimes it's the problem is with us and with our perceptions. Sometimes it's not. Faith in God comes naturally, in my opinion. Atheism, atheism is formed from hurt and from bitterness. Every culture in history believed in some form of divinity, where a polytheistic culture adapted from one with a primary God who lost his place. So what I mean is this. If you look at all the different cultures of the world, you find this amazing fact that as far as I know, all of them, I've never heard of an atheist culture from ancient times. I've never heard of it. It might have existed, but I, I've never heard of it. Uh, for all these different cultures believed in a bunch of gods, and of those bunch of gods, they all developed in the same way. There was a there was one god, or not really necessarily that they didn't believe in other gods, but an almighty god. Uh, in, uh, in some cultures, he's called the sky god or whatever. And then gradually throughout history, he loses his importance, and the other gods kind of rise up to take his place. It's a common occurrence throughout human history, and uh, it's just – it's natural for people to believe in God. We see that by examining history, by examining social development. And uh, then it's also important that monotheistic religions today spawn from the same 
one, Judaism. Now, I'm, it, it's not that everyone always believed in God or gods for all time, but it was the natural part of culture to believe in a God. And so I think that it's important to to take things in its stride. You know, these people who have dealt, dealt with this religious abuse that they've gone through, they, they've gotten, they've landed on this kind of dark place. But you have to understand the trauma in between start and finish and how it developed and what to do with that. You, you can't just ignore the journey and say, well, you shouldn't believe like that or you shouldn't think like that or you shouldn't feel like that. Maybe they shouldn't, but that's where they are from the journey. Um, you have to fight your own struggle of faith regardless of your reasons not to. And that's where the, a lot of this comes down to do with religious abuse. Each of us, or many of us, have been a hurt in a church environment, some more than others. And at the end of the day, it it's, comes down to a personal choice. You have these people who grew up in church and, and just have been so hurt that they just turned bitter. They got out of church, they never looked back. They have to fight their own fight. You can't give them all the right answers. You can't fix the problem. The pain and the hurt is there. They have to eventually get to a place of fighting their own fight for faith. Maybe you have been have been hurt by the church in the past. The only way forward is for you to learn to fight your own fight of faith. Has somebody hurt you? You got to work through it. And um and you're going to have reasons not to, but you still have to choose to fight it. Um it you also can't uh, you also can't just put it on somebody else. Um, it doesn't matter what other people in your generation are doing with their bitterness. You have to own it yourself. What am I doing? You don't just pass it off on other people. They have to work through their hangups like we do ours. There's no easy answer to this problem. It, it is something that is very much so real. However, remember that it's not only the fake left. Um, so there's some things that we do that kind of perpetuates the problem, causes the problem of religious abuse to continue. Uh, one of these things is how we treat ourself um, in the church context. Sometimes we are we have too high of a standard uh, for ourselves, try and make our, hold ourselves up to perfection, um, try and make us be without fault. Sometimes we, li we live our lives to please others. We, we, we live it for the attempt of, of making somebody else happy with us so that we can earn praise, so that we can feel better about ourselves, so we can find our worth and our, and our value and our purpose and what other people say about us. Um, we make our whole thing a game of, of what does so-and-so think of me? Um, or sometimes uh, we, we just stop trying. Uh, sometimes we stay too busy, uh, overwork ourselves. We, we do too much. We neglect our health. We, oh, you know, I don't have to take care of myself. I can work myself to death. And you see a lot of pastors doing this kind of stuff. So that is actually creating an environment of religious abuse. How we treat ourselves is perpetuating the problem. Um, another thing, uh, another thing that perpetuates the problem is how we treat outsiders. Um, one one thing that we do pretty common, and I'm going to point to something else on the next slide, but um, we kind of become argumentative by trying to have all the answers. So because I'm insecure about my faith, I don't want to share the faith. So then I'll read a bunch of books by like Lee Strobel or whatever about apologetics and theology. And so then I'll go to the other extreme and become very argumentative and just go looking for a fight. I'm going to go on all the YouTube comments. I'm going to go on all the Facebook things. I'm going to go looking for a fight and just shoot off my mouth all the time and say stupid things all the time. It's like, well, you know, that's, that's not, really, not really helping. It's more of perpetuating the problem. It is creating the environment of religious abuse. When you are constantly going into fights and saying stuff in a real mean, hateful attitude, telling, the, telling them the truth, it's something that, that pushes people away from God and it creates the problem, it causes the problem to continue that leaves people feeling abused from religion. You, you, you can't be uh, divisive and, and combative about everything. You just can't. Now, there's this idea that the last generation had that it was, it was a good thing um, to, you know, um, to get all up in people's faces and tell them, you need to repent. I'm telling it how it is. Somebody needed to. All these fake pastors stepping around the issues won't address sin. Well, it's not that you don't address sin. It's that you use a little bit more of your brain than how quickly can I make this person be irritated. 
you know, you have to go to witnessing with a little bit more intelligence than that. Um, now, it's common to overlook people for knowledge. If you do a lot of studying, it's very, com very common that your knowledge will overwrite your love. You'll know all the answers, and you won't be so concerned about what they feel. So read, a, read Christian apologetics books and then develop a lack of love for people. And that's a very unfortunate thing. So how you balance this is that you stay in prayer, you stay in the Bible, and you read those books. But you remember to close your mouth and open your ears. And that really helps. And if you read the Bible, it talks a lot about these different things. Being gentle and kind. It talks about the way of, you know, anger does not produce the righteousness of, 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 of God. So you go to your kids, for instance, and you're yelling at them, you're, you're getting all irritated. Is that going to produce God's righteousness? No, because man's anger just never produces God's righteousness. Um, trying to cram God down, down people's throats does not work out very well. And, and seeking out pointless arguments like, oh, I, I, can, I can win this argument, and, and it'll show them God, and they'll, they'll turn to God, and no, no, they won't. Here's the thing you have to remember with all these different things with, with dealing with people who are rejecting the gospel, whether they've experienced in the past or haven't. It has to be their choice. It's not yours. Each person has to make their own choice. As a pastor, this is very frustrating because you want to try and help people. You want to try and force people to, to make the changes you think they need to change. It's not your choice. When you witness somebody, you want to see people saved, you want to see people changed, it's not your choice. It's their choice. You can't ultimately prove faith. You can give reasons for faith, but ultimately it has to be something that, that, that has to become real. You have to experience it. You can have your mom and dad tell you about God, but until you really experience and encounter God, it's nothing more than th the tradition that you follow. And when you try to prove faith, it, it may actually more of reflect your own insecurities and your beliefs. So I'm insecure about what if I'm believing the wrong thing, so I'll go to the over extreme of trying to argue with everybody else and convince them so that, see what I mean? It's more I'm insecure and I'm trying to cover it up by being argumentative with others. If you're, if you're firm in your belief, then you really don't need to have somebody else agree with you to validate your belief. You can stand on your belief knowing that it's true. Let's say everybody in the whole world thinks that the earth is flat. Everybody. All everybody. But I know that the earth is round. I won't be insecure in my knowledge because you, you, get, what, you get what I'm saying? So, okay. All right. So uh, some more areas that we perpetuate the problem. Once again, how we treat others. Forcing God on them and misquoting scripture to hurt them. So this is this is two different things. First off, forcing God on them, and I'll try to cram it down there. You will believe in God, and then the other thing, misquoting Scripture to hurt them. So, um, you know, oh, well, you are a sinner. The Bible says this sinner, and it's like, okay, well, probably not the best solution. Um, another area that we create we create the environment that causes religious abuse. We perpetuate the problem. How we treat those in the church? Are we loving and patient? Are we forgiving, or are we divisive gossips? How do we treat our own? The Bible constantly says this, you should do this all the more to those of the faith. The idea being that people in the church, you shouldn't treat worse than you treat people in the world. You should treat them even better as being part of a family. Not that you should mistreat the world, but you get what I'm saying. So um, people pleasers are, you know, this when the Bible says... Uh, do things as for God, not not as though to please people. People pleasers are persuaded from obedience because they're trying to make somebody else happy. And so when God says obey, they say, oh, I'll, I'll obey as much as people don't get mad at me. Um, people pleasers are, are persuaded to live for praise. They'll do something so long as they get a pat on the back. Um, people pleasers uh, try to impress others. And uh, people ple pleasers also have poor motivations for why they do the things or they only do a good job if someone is watching and I think that these kinds of attitudes really do a lot to make the problem that we're seeing now with all these people going through all this different abuse that they've dealt with and experienced in religion how, how, how people how Christians tend to treat themselves how Christians tend to treat outsiders and how Christians tend to treat each other 
and they're not really learning from the lesson. We're just kind of perpetuating the same thing. And I'll del delve into this more in a little bit, but we get mistreated in the church, and so then we miss out, mistreat other people in the church. And it's like, you know, that's not really the way to deal with this. So, so where do we go to now? How, how, do we, how do we get out of this rut? Well, this is a very important thing that I've learned, and I wanted to share it with you. Many of us were mistreated by the last generation in church, but here's the thing. We are quickly taking their place. It was easy back in the day when we were kids who were hurt. Well, now it's just got a heck of a lot harder because they're all dying off and they're being replaced by us. Mm -hmm. Just like we will one day die off and be replaced by the next generation. See, it was easier when we could put it all, all off on them. They did such a bad job in the church. They did such a bad job making people feel loved. They, they, they... Now it's our problem. What are we doing? What are we doing to fix the problem? What are we doing to not continue doing the same thing? It's becoming our problem now. And that's that's a little bit of a change. It was a lot easier when we could just when we were kids and we were going to live forever and the problem was all theirs. They just needed to change. They were just bitter nasty people and see what I mean? Well, n now we're becoming those bitter nasty people and we need to, you know, do a little bit of an analysis here. Are we contributing to the problem or making it better? And I would follow that up with this. Are we doing any better? Are we what the church needs? Are we doing what we wish that they would have done? Do we gossip and complain? Do we welcome them in when we don't like them, whoever them is? Are we a model of love? We can't let ourselves get stuck in the loop of how bad they did and not do any better ourselves. Doing something with complaining isn't doing a good job. If you want to do a good job, if you want to do better than them, do the best you can, but do it without complaining. That will make a huge difference. difference. Uh, and so one thing that I have learned is that I am not any better than the, than the last generation or the next generation. Every generation does some stupid stuff, and that's just how it is. Like the last generation is real big on this right now. You know, there's always a there's always a little bit of um, uh, problems between generations of my ways right and your ways wrong. But the the last generation is is, take, is taking this way too far. They're 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 kind of causing a lot of problems with. All these pan, these pansies. We're the last of a dying breed, and it's like you guys had your own problems. Trust me, you know. And so now, you know, we're we're gonna have to do the exact same thing when we get older. We're gonna look at the next generation and say these people, they're just, these kids are just, you know, irresponsible, rubbing their hands on heaters, and and we're the know, last of a dying breed. And we're the last of a dying breed. <laughs> I saw a post today that was like, uh, for sure, the '90s was the peak of civilization. <laughs> Really? Yeah. The nineties? Wow, what did they base this on? The amazing nineties. I am gonna disagree with that. I lived it. I know it. Um, so every generation does some stupid stuff. Do what the church needs tomorrow. And uh, how do we, so then the question a question that I also ask myself, how do we make it worse? How do we make things worse in the church? Well, I think tearing down others Accepting where the church is without any attempt to lead it different. When you just look at the church and you notice all of its problems, you do nothing to help it. You do nothing to change it. You do nothing to be the, the change that you want to see. Um, when you allow problems to persist, when you talk about others, when you choose not to grow, and you just say, you know what, I'm comfortable here, I don't have to grow. When you when you don't read the Bible or, or, or pray or, or, or serve or give, it's all about you. The church isn't about the church. I was actually reading a study today um, that this organization it does. It's an ongoing study, but it's to, to date they've uh, polled over or they've done research on over 400,000 Christians. Christians who read the Bible four times or more per week are 53% less likely to look at porn. No way. 53% yeah. less likely if you wow. read the Bible four or more times per week. Well, shoot, man. A study of 400,000 Christians. Wow. This is the kind of stuff that we can't just keep pushing off and saying, oh, well, they didn't do it right. Our generation is retarded when it comes to the Bible. They have no idea what's in the Bible. <laughs> really 
what are you going to do to fix that? The gen last generation had faults, but they didn't do everything wrong. Are we going to learn from what they did right? Or are we just going to criticize everything they did wrong? Are we going to take the step to fix what's wrong? Or are we just going to be masters of pointing out the errors of everything? The church should have done this. The church should, Yes, I agree. The church should have done those things. My greatest hurts, we talked about this last week, my greatest hurts were from Christians. My greatest disappointments were in the church. I'm not arguing these things. I'm saying, are we going to move forward or are we going to complain about the past? You can't have both. You can try, but you'll never get it. Doing what was done to you is not the way to fix things. Not connecting with others is not the way to fix things. Refusing others' opinions. Oh, I have all the right answers. I don't care what anybody else thinks. That's not the way to fix things. So what we do is we become, my dad calls it victims becoming victimizers. And I, I'm going to say it a little bit differently because I didn't really like the way that this word is kind of hard to understand. So let me see if I can kind of one-up old pappy. Uh, so basically, okay. You're a kid. Um, every day your dad gets home from work, gets drunk, beats you. You are the victim. You grow up and you kind of develop all of these maybe repression issues, a lot of these passive-aggressive things, and then boils over and then maybe even with you having a yelling match. And you pride yourself maybe on the fact that, why well, never laid a finger on anybody. But you can still see the way that you're taking out taking out with how you talk to other people how you treat other people with the little subtle threats that that are underneath the surface of your marriage these kinds of things and it's like you might not do the same thing but you are so very much so making victims still maybe in the way that you treat your kids or maybe in the way that you neglect to treat your kids um these kinds of things and you know these are these are things that we need to be aware of we have to be what we want the church to be. Make make it what it should be. And whatever else, keep moving forward. Analyze how you are treating others. Look at your life and say, how am I treating others? Not just new, not just people who are already in the church, but newcomers, people who are coming into the church. How am I how am I treating them? And what can you learn from what was done to you? This is what was done to me in the church. This, this, and this. What can I learn from that? How can I help other people? What did I most want? When I first came to the church and I was that little insecure person, what did I want from the church? And how can I do that to the next generation? How can I do that to somebody else who need it, needs it? Working in the church has become very toxic because it is not based off of the faith. You, you have to be too busy. Never it's, you know, Whatever you do, it's not good enough. Um, you try to make everyone happy. Putting out fires all day, poor salary, no grace is given when you mess up, doing everything by yourself, uh, and uh, not being supported, not having anyone. So how can you make the church a, a not tox a toxic place to work? To work? Well, let's look at that. Too busy. When you have somebody on your team, don't work them so hard. Um, ne never good enough. Let people know that, that they are good enough, that you appreciate their effort, that they did a good job. Um, trying to make everyone happy. Let somebody know that you're not working as a people pleaser. You're working for God. And let that be okay. Let let them own mistakes. Have it be an environment where it's like, okay, we try things here. We mess up on, on a lot of things, but we try things. And when we mess up, that's totally okay. Um, putting out fires all day. Don't complain about everything all the time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, don't complain about stuff all the time. You know, when... When you work in ministry and your job is to put out fires all, all day, sometimes you you start doing the same thing. And you start complaining about everything. This isn't right. This isn't right. So now you're making fires for other people to put out. <laughs> so if you want to find out how to fix the church, look at the things that are making it toxic in the past and say, well, what can I do to fix that? Now, uh, one thing I brought up a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to um, finish the thought because hopefully we'll finish this um, this tonight hopefully, um, is that th sometimes there's this idea that as Christians you have to be friends with everybody and you have to be besties with everybody. And just because somebody calls themselves a Christian that you have to believe them. And that's not the case at all. And so I wanted to read some passages. Um, I know last time I brought it up it kind of caused a lot of, a lot of – um, confusion for Isaiah, so I'm hoping that I can say it tonight in a better way. Um, the first example of is in Romans 16, 17. It says, 
Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings which you learned, and turn away from them. Do not associate with them. Uh, for such people are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So what he just said was, if there's somebody who's causing division, somebody who's causing problems in the church, don't hang around with them. Just because somebody calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean it's your problem. Do you understand that? There's there's this there's this kind of attitude that's existed in the church for a long time that if somebody has calls themselves a Christian, I have to believe them, and I have to cater to them, and I have to walk on eggshells to make sure that everybody else is happy, and this kind of it's just not a very accurate understanding of what the Bible is saying. And then the second place uh, that I wanted to specifically look at is in First Corinthians. <clears throat> First Corinthians should not have closed my Bible. Uh, five, one through two. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and sexual immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, namely that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. And then in verses nine through eleven, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the greedy and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person, or a greedy person, or idolater, or is verbally abusive, or habitually drunk, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. So he's not talking about Christians who are struggling. He's talking about Christians who are living in their sin and saying, this is who I am. Oh, this is, this is the part that I was confused Right. About. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we are all going to sin in different ways. That's not what Paul's talking about. There's going to be some of us who, who, who live in our sin and we say, yep, this is what I'm choosing to do. And the Bible tells us to avoid such people as these. And it's very important if we're trying to make the church a place where people are no longer religiously abused, they are, we aren't excusing this crappy behavior. You don't have to hang around everyone who calls themselves Christians. And here's the thing. What, what the last generation did is they said that we had to excuse it, right? So they were always excusing the friendly fire or making it your fault. Okay, like this. Oh, this person's a jerk and they're treating me terribly. But you know what? It's okay. It's okay. I just have to smooth things over. I just have to – Matthew 18 says to go and talk to the person. If they won't, if they won't hear hear reason, you take another with you, and if it still doesn't work, you t you take it to the leadership, and then the church takes disciplinary measures. I don't know where this idea came about that just because somebody calls themselves a Christian, they can act like a butthole. That's just wrong. There's nowhere in the Bible that validates that. Oh, I have this crappy attitude, and you all have to cater to me. Excuse me? I don't think the Bible says that at all. In fact, I know it doesn't say that. It actually says that if somebody is living in a sin like that, that they are re-crucifying Christ all over again. I think that he was very serious when he said that's not a joke. And I, I think that you know nowadays we, we write it off like it's not that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. A lot of Christians are getting hurt because there's people in the church calling themselves Christians who are snide, gossips, bitter, divisive, hateful, mean, greedy these are not christians they're not good examples they're people who only care about themselves it looks like you're trying to say something so i'll shut up <laughs> it's almost like they're a wolf in sheep's clothing exactly like they're in a wolf in sheep clothing it's not just fa false teachers there's also false no. christians mm -hmm. and uh, then the second thing that people do it, that, that's gotten real popular is not just excusing friendly fire but making it your fault so basically Gracie's over here gossiping, and she's saying snide things, but it was Nicole's fault because Nicole said something mean to Gracie, so it's okay that Gracie's doing We are all responsible for our own actions, and it is our responsibility to go to God in, in repentance and say, forgive me for what I've done, Father. I, that is absolutely essential. A, part, a key part of being a Christian is going to God in repentance. We think this idea of one and done, like, oh, I'm saved, so I never have to... No. God teaches us to go to him and confess our sins to him. How will we ever find healing if, he, if we don't? So it's very important. Stay away from such, as, such people as these. If we do not, the church will always be a place where people are abused rather than healed.
So uh, everybody sins, but there were some living in sin. I already mentioned that. Um, this guy was somebody who boldly had his father's wife, and they were accepting it. Oh, you know, this person it's, – it's, the example would be nowadays when, when there's a, a person living in homosexuality. Not somebody struggling with homosexual feelings. Somebody living in homosexuality and saying, God still loves me anyways. The issue wasn't whether God, was, God loves you. The issue is whether you were obeying him or not. So evidently you don't love him. That's the issue. If you loved him, you'd obey him. And uh, so then they, they, they live in sin like that. And, the, and then what does the church nowadays do? Well, they accept it. We're supposed to accept the sinners, not to accept people calling themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. Living in sin boldly, that's just no. That's no. So the difference between... Um, so this isn't the same as struggling in an area. We are human and we never attain perfection or sinlessness here on earth. Get used to, get used to failures. Um, if we think we don't have to listen to warnings or see it as non-Christian for the church to be holy... By not associating with these troublemakers, we hurt ourselves and others. And also, we help them to be rebellious. We help the person who's divisive to be rebellious. Because they cause a problem, and then they leave the church, and then we go and still associate with them. So what, what happens? What you did is okay. We're, we're reinforcing them. And then when we get around them, it's going to rub off on us. I, it actually is a very common issue nowadays that I was just talking to somebody about today. Oh, right. Uh, we're pastors will feel like they are exempt from this rule of staying away from divisive people. And so what we do as pastors is we keep putting forth all this energy and effort into these divisive people who don't want to change, and then we get ourselves all worn out and tired. When the Bible said the whole time, leave them alone. But we think we can fix everybody. Us pastors have this constant you know, insecurity and ego problem that, that we think anything that can happen has to be done by us and we can fix everything. If you're ever a pastor, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And so then, you know, you go to this problem person, even though the Bible says, okay, warn them once and twice and then, then be done with it. We're going to keep going towards it because we think we know better than God. And then when, we, when we're really tired a year or two down the road, somehow it's going to be God's fault. I'm not sure yet exactly how, but we'll make it God's <laughs> fault. Gosh darn it. Um, and I, uh, I actually had a family member that did this, causing divisions and lying about stuff. Um, and those who kept supporting her rather than obeying God were captivated by sin. She started going into sin, and then people started flocking to her and validating her. And then what happened? Every single one of them got tied up in sin. Every single one of them. And some of them actually became physically ill. Some became bitter. It, it, the whole event caused a church split. And uh, it became a community affair because then she started going into the community, lying about what had, what had happened, spreading rumors and gossip. The family was 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 a wreck from what happened. All this from this one loudmouth person. Did this happen to us or to to, to, to to me personally? Yes, a family member that did this. And um, you know, it, well, when people are divisive, you don't have to excuse it to keep the peace. There will be no peace with them around. If you want peace, you cannot excuse the crappy behavior. You have to address the crappy behavior. Does that make sense? It's like this. I was playing this video game called Mass Effect, and one of the characters says, there's two ways to make peace. You, one is you can help the person. The other one is you can, hurt, you can kill the person who's hurting them. And I definitely understand his argument. I think that it's pretty dead on. Um, you don't have to keep hanging around them or it will affect you eventually. I already mentioned that. They will try to make it everyone else's fault why they are a, div a divisive person. You just got to let it go. They'll gossip to you and then about you, but it was their choice the whole time. It's only your fault if you caused the hurt, but you're not – well, I shouldn't say that. It's not – let me say this. It's not your fault if you – I mean, sorry, it's only your fault. You are responsible for causing hurt in somebody else. And now I'll say this. Just because somebody blames you doesn't mean it's your fault. There's going to be a lot of people who try and invite you to an offense. They, they are upset, and they want you to be upset too, and they'll try to welcome you in, like, come be upset with me. Just because you were invited to that party doesn't mean you have to go to it. One time I was going to the church to grab something, and there was this woman there, uh, and she was cleaning, and she just kept trying to make me upset by different things. Oh, well, the computer was left on. And somebody, I said, it, it, 
it's fine. I had it updating all night, and that's why I'm here. I'm here to turn it off. So I'm just let, let, the, let, the, let the office doors open. She's just trying to make everything this major big deal, and I was like, it's fine. If it bothers you, you can close it, but it's not a big deal. Well, somebody left coffee in the coffee pot. Okay, well, I'll... I'll clean it out on Saturday. It's it's not a big deal. Like whatever. You see what I mean? Everything had to be this big this big thing. And here's the thing: she was trying to invite me to an offense. I refused the invitation. There's gonna be people in your life that do that. They're gonna they'll they'll try to get you into. I'm upset, and I want you to be upset, or I want you to be upset with me, or I just want to make your life hell. And you can either accept that invitation and let them get you in a crappy mood. Or you can say, no, thank you, and you don't have to go to that. You don't have to go to that party. You don't have to get all bent out of shape. You don't have to take up an offense. You don't have to receive blame just because somebody blames you for something. Nicole, you're a terrible example for a Christian. It's all your fault why I fell. And do, do, do. just because I'm mad at you doesn't mean you have to accept that. You can say, nope. And well. <laughs> I'm bitter and refuse to change and grow, but it's your fault. Okay. Um, either you didn't do everything perfect, or you didn't feed them, or whatever. It happens all the time in ministry. And um, well, one more thing I want to say about this: I see a lot of people who live in abusive relationships because they're insecure. And I think a lot of things happen in the church. A lot of the same thing happen, things happen in the church too. Somebody's insecure, they're hurting, and so they allow abuse because they're insecure. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah. So how do we deal with it? Number one, if you did it, if you are the person who's caused who's caused trauma in the church, commit to growth. Make it a part of who you are. Read books, go go to church, pray, read the Bible, do whatever you can. Worship God, do whatever you can to commit to growth. Judge your actions. When you do something, look at yourself and say, how am I living? And is this the kind of choices that I want to make? Um, go to the people that you've hurt and ask for forgiveness. Develop a healthy devotional life and be willing to change. Now, that's going to be harder the older you get. The more years you have, the harder it is to admit you need to grow and then be willing to grow and then to actually grow and change. If they are the one causing the problem, well, first off, or if they are... Sometimes you need to address things and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you need to let other people address things and sometimes you don't need to address it all. There's different circumstances based on different authority roles. For instance, if somebody's kid is doing it, you go to the, you'd go to the parent. If there's an issue with with this woman, it might be a better idea to talk to her, talk to their spouse, or talk to, with him and her together. Things like that. If it's somebody who's in a position over you, it might. See what I mean? Some things are a little bit more complicated, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, so if they are the one doing it, forgive whoever has done it to you. Forgive them. It's done. Okay. Release your claim on how hard they, how bad they've hurt you, and then leave it in the past. Don't keep reliving it. Don't keep going to it. Don't don't think about it. Realize that you need grace too. If they are divisive people, well then keep your distance. For, you know, forgive them or whatever, but then keep your distance. There's been a lot of people in the church that I grew up that hurt with, grew up with that hurt me a lot. That I've accept I've accepted it. I've forgiven them. They they are a mean nasty person, so I I keep my distance. And, and, and people always try to make you feel guilty about it. There was actually a person who was um, who who left the church uh, this this last year, and uh, they were just always trying to cause problems. And you know, it was always somebody else's fault on these different things. So I just started keeping my distance, and they got all hurt about it. Like, oh, well, and it's like I don't have to associate with you. The Bible tells me actually not to, and I don't have to keep going and getting offended. See, this is what happens: we keep running into that brick wall, then we keep getting hurt, then we get bitter about it. So keep your distance, pray for them, do the right thing even if you don't feel like it, which is going to be very difficult to do. If it was done to you, if you have experienced religious abuse, heal. Getting out of church won't fix the problem. It's just like getting a divorce. It won't fix the problem. 
it makes it less likely that you will fix the problem, actually. The longer you stay out of church, the harder it will be to get back into it. The more these things will haunt you. They'll follow after you. It'll, oh, and it, it just will be a bad place to be in. And one, one, of the, one of the things you can do to heal, though, is connect with genuine people who do care. They are out there, and you can find them. Uh, go to therapy. Uh, commit to growth. Um, and I'm talking about personal growth. Commit to personal growth. Uh, choose to move on. That this is actually a, a effort that you have to make where you say, okay, I'm letting it go. I'm letting it go. And you have to actually like consciously make that choice. Um, another thing um, uh, is not isolating. Sometimes when we've been hurt, we kind of just like to go off by ourselves. Um, in all the studies I've ever read or been told about concerning burnout, and the number one contributing factor to getting better was in social interaction. In other words, having people that you can talk to, having friends. And I know it, it, it hurts when you have people who push you out of their life, who hurt you and all these different things. A lot of people never move on from that. Um, and I understand why. It's happened to me numerous times. But one of the key important things is to go to people, actually connect with people. And it's hard when there was someone who was so close to you that stabs you in the back to then go out and put yourself out on the – there's this line on this song by Brian Fallon. Um, but it, it's hard when you're hurt to let, it, to let somebody in again. I get it. It is hard. It's never going to get easier either. Um Draw closer to God and not let your focus be consumed by the nonsense. Sometimes you're going to be in a place in life where there's nonsense happening all around you. And if you let it, it will be your soul waking thought. You'll dream about it at night. It'll rob all your joy. Don't let it be your whole attention. Somebody did you wrong. I'm sorry. Let it go. Don't think about it. The more you just let it sit there and stew in your mind, the more it's just going to change you and ruin you. There's this line from this book that I read, and it, go, it goes something like this. You have to accept that it happened, but you don't have to accept that you deserved it. There's a point when you have to deal with the trauma that you've gone through, but you can't let it change what God says about you and your worth. So when you encounter others who have been abused by the church, the number one course of action, don't try to give them all the answers. Don't think that you know it all. Simply listen. You don't have to agree with what they're saying. You don't have to listen to gossip. Um, there was actually one person who was very much so hurt by the church. It's a long story, and I don't have her permission to share it, so I won't. But it was a it was very jacked up things happening. And um, she... There was another pastor who tried to argue with her about it and whatnot, and so she came to me and was trying to gossip to me about the other pastor. And I should have probably said something like, um, I don't believe in gossip, you know, or something like that, something holy and righteous. But all that really came to my mind was, I'm no different than, than that pastor. I've done the exact same things to people who came into my church. You know, I played the victim and then turned right around and, you know, treated people like that. I mean, I've had I've had this same argument that he's having with you. I've had it with you. And she said, oh, but you changed. And I said, yeah, maybe he'll change too. Yeah, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I should have just said, oh, I don't gossip. But all that I could think of in that moment was the way that here she was trusting in me. And I was like, what have I done to ever deserve your trust? I'm no different than this guy that you're all upset about. Anyways, uh, when we grow, we get frustrated with those who don't. This is something that's gonna that you're gonna deal with. You're gonna commit to growth, and you're gonna see other people in your life who don't commit to growth, and it's gonna frustrate you because you're gonna know I used to be there, I'm not there anymore, and you're gonna look at them, and they refuse to move from where they are, and you're gonna get frustrated by it. And the more you grow, the more you grow, the less tolerance you will get of other people not growing. Be aware of this because if you start dealing with your religious abuse and you start getting over the trauma, you're going to run into people who, won't, who don't want to grow past it. 
and it's going to make you get irritated at them. Remember when you get irritated to keep your mouth shut. So we're we're getting to the end of this end of this deal here. I got this slide and then the closing slide. So be aware of how you are treating others and what kind of atmosphere you are encouraging in the church by your actions, your attitude, those kinds of things. Um, are, are, is your relationship with other people rushed? Is it is it shallow? Is it over demanding or overworking? Don't don't give up on these things. So may, maybe the only thing keeping a, keeping the church from being a miserable place is a few good Christians who are willing to be mistreated and still love. Maybe the only thing keeping the, keeping the church from just being a total wreck is a few good Christians who are praying. A few good Christians who are still pursuing holiness. Don't give up. I know it's hard, especially when you when it seems like everybody else is just mean, hateful people. You don't let bitter people justify you becoming a bitter person. This is the probably the biggest lesson I learned last year. If somebody is a gossip and divisive, and you turn bitter because they're bitter, and so you start gossiping and being divisive about, uh, divisive about the gossip de divisive person, you are now the bitter gossip divisive person. You see how that works? Don't let somebody else turn you into something that you're not. Don't let somebody else turn you into something that you're not. So um, we, we are done with this, with religious abuse. We will look at uh, contradictions in the yeah, that should say in the Gospels. We're not looking at contradictions in the whole of the Bible, just in the Gospels. We're going to go through them. You might notice that in the Gospels, there's numerous stories that, that have different things in them. They're not all the exact same. Why is that? And how do we deal with the with the things in the Gospel that seem very much like contradictions? For instance, um, who was the first person to Jesus' tomb? And was there one angel or two? Uh, was it one woman who got there first, or were there more than one? And did they go straight to Peter and the other disciples, or did they not? What's going on there? There's a lot of things that seem like a bunch of contradictions. We're gonna we're gonna look at specifically the gospels, the stories, comparing them in the different gospels, and whether they're contradictions or not. And um, but before we close, I wanted to read a verse that I think goes with this, um, and say just a few two quick points. First quick point: church, the church will never be perfect, and neither will you. You have to accept the church with its flaws, just like you expect people to to accept you with your flaws. And then the second point, the only way forward is by growing past our hurts. You will never move forward if you're not willing to grow past your hurts. It's hard, but that's the way it is. First Thessalonians 5, 15 through 18 says this, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, and in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, that you give thanks, pray without ceasing, rejoice always, and not repay evil for evil. So I think that that's the best place to end this study on. It's been one heck of a long ride. Now you see why I couldn't have finished it last week, because we had another 53 minutes to go. That would have made the, made the lesson a grand total of 80 minutes instead of the 30 minutes last week and the 53 minutes this week. So you were, you were exhausted last week. I was exhausted and I had to hit the road and I was in a crappy mood and the kids were pissing me off something fierce. <laughs> Anyways, any questions or comments about this? Kind of one more Go ahead. Our generation likes to complain about the older generations, but yet we're turning into those older generations from a personality standpoint and not fixing anything, just leaving things the way it was <laughs> and expecting it to just magically fix itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah.